This is part 5 of my talk about how to process arenogram. In part 1 I gave an introduction and explained what arenogram is and in part 2 I talked about the importance of background subtraction and showed how to recognize when it's been done correctly. In part 3 I showed some examples using different background subtraction methods and in part 4 I talked about how to draw the regions of interest as are required. Now in part 5 I'm going to talk about the recommended background subtraction methods, the perirenal background and the Rutland method, as well as talking about deconvolution. So let's look at the methods recommended for background subtraction of the renogram in various published guidelines. ISCORN, which is the International Scientific Committee of Radionuclides in Nephrourology, uh, produced a consensus report in 1999. That seems a long time ago, but in fact the committee had met for several years before they agreed on their consensus document. The trouble is you get a group of experts on renogram processing together and they all have their own favourite ideas about the best way to perform background subtraction and so it took the committee several years of meetings to come up with a consensus. Their published consensus does in fact recommend the perirenal region of interest as a good method for simple background subtraction and they said that that method was validated using nephrectomy data. However, as I pointed out in part 4 of this talk, uh, using nephrectomy data to validate a background subtraction technique isn't ideal because when you perform a nephrectomy you remove the kidney along with all the blood background within the kidney itself. So a method that works for nephrectomy data is only shown to be good for removing the tissue surrounding the kidney and any blood in tissues near to the kidney but it doesn't show that you can remove the blood background from within the kidney itself. So although this method may have been considered adequate at the time, by modern standards where we try to remove the vascular background as well, it doesn't really work as well as it could do. The ISCORN report said that a relative function could be measured using either the integral method or the Rutland plot. I'll explain the integral method in part 6 of this talk, but basically it uses the area under the background subtractive curve. So they say that you start by doing background subtraction with a perirenal region of interest and then either use the integral method to calculate relative function from that curve or if you want to additionally subtract the blood background you go on to produce the Rutland plot but after you've done the perirenal background subtraction. The Society of Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Imaging in America and the European Association of Nuclear Medicine produced their latest joint guidelines on how to process the renogram in 2018. Basically they came up with the same recommendation as the ISCORN report. So that means if you're using the Rutland plot you apply the perirenal background subtraction first. In my opinion that leads to unnecessary complications which I'll discuss further in a separate talk of, about the Rutland method. But basically both guidelines came up with the recommendation that you can use the perirenal region of interest for simple background subtraction and then if you want to perform blood background subtraction as well you go on to do the Rutland plot. However, the British Nuclear Medicine Society guidelines also recommend the perirenal background if you're going to use the integral method for relative function, but say that if you want a more robust measure of relative function, you can replace the perirenal background subtraction with a simple tissue background only subtraction if you then go on to do the Rutland plot to remove the vascular background. So basically you have the choice of either using the perirenal or the Rutland plot or a combination of the two. Now if we're looking at perirenal background uh, it can be drawn automatically by the computer system once the kidney regions have been drawn. All you need to do is have a predefined start angle and end angle in order to miss out the medial bit where the ureters come out um, and specify the gap from the kidney to the background and the width of the background and then the computer will draw these C-shaped regions about left and right kidney automatically once the kidney region has been drawn. The software will then subtract the background using the average counts per pixel which I've explained in part 4.
the advantages of this method is that it does give different background readings for left and right kidneys, which may or may not be appropriate. Um, and also it's not operator dependent, uh, which means it's reproducible. So if different operators uh, draw the kidney regions, then you'll still get the same background region. It doesn't depend on the uh, individual operator. However, that is also a disadvantage because it means it can't be manually optimized because um, if it doesn't give the correct subtraction, if you don't think that the background subtracted curve satisfies the criteria of rising from zero, then if you repeat it you'll get exactly the same answer because it doesn't change anything. So it can be reproducible but it may be reproducibly incorrect. It also gives a fixed amount of blood in the background. The background is mostly tissue but is some blood from these regions. Um, but it doesn't work well for hydronephrotic kidneys where the amount of blood in the kidney is small because of the large amount of urine in the dilated renal pelvis in a hydronephrotic kidney as I showed in the examples in part 3. And as I showed in part 4 it can also be upset by liver uptake of MAG3. The Rutland method uses a background region below the kidney to subtract tissue background um, and it uses the average counts per pixel from that region to subtract tissue background from the kidney. But it then also chooses a separate vascular region somewhere above the kidney, usually the spleen or the heart, to determine blood activity and calculates the appropriate amount of blood background to subtract individually from each kidney. The graph that is produced is called the Rutland plot, although it's sometimes also known as the, the Patlag plot, because Patlag used the same graph in other circumstances. But Rutland published this technique for use in the kidneys, so in this context I like to call it the Rutland plot. The advantages of this is that it allows for different amounts of blood in each kidney, which works well in all situations, even in hydronephrotic kidneys, because it adjusts the amount of blood appropriately. The disadvantage, unfortunately, is that it's not available on all nuclear medicine systems because some manufacturers haven't produced the software to implement this method. Just to explain a little bit about the Rutland plot, when we do a normal renogram, we give a simple injection into a vein and we observe the uh, activity in the kidneys following that. But imagine instead that uh, we give a, a constant infusion. So instead of just a single injection we hook the patient up to an infusion pump and give a continuous infusion of MAG3 into a vein in the arm. If we do that we could arrange that the blood activity remains constant uh, because we're replenishing what's lost by, into the kidneys with the new infusion from the, the pump. So in those circumstances we would have a blood activity that rose when we start the infusion and thereafter we could maintain it nice and constant during the study. In those circumstances the kidney activity would rise uh, in a straight line because if the blood activity is constant the uptake into the kidney every minute is the same and so the rise every minute would be the same and it would therefore rise in a straight line at least until after a few minutes when the kidney began to empty and activity passed on into the bladder. But initially we get a straight line linear uptake. Moreover since the blood activity is constant, the blood background in the renogram would also be constant. So we would get a simple uh, renogram like this from a constant infusion. The graph we can call the Rutland plot, but we don't actually need to give a constant infusion in order to achieve this because the Rutland method um, is a mathematical technique that will take the real renogram data and use it to predict what this ideal constant infusion renogram would look like. And it does that by comparing the actual kidney curve with the actual blood curve and manipulating them to produce this Rutland plot, which you can think of this simulated ideal renogram. That means that the slope of this initial part of the renogram in the Rutland plot uh, 
would be a measure of the kidney function and the intercept where it starts would measure how much blood background there is present in this particular kidney. So this Rutland plot is easy to interpret because it quantifies the uptake by the slope of the graph and it determines the amount of blood background from the intercept of the graph. In comparison I just like to mention another technique which is deconvolution. We've just looked at a situation where we can have an ideal renogram from a constant infusion which we were able to simulate with the Rutland plot. Let's now look at a different situation where we can imagine an ideal renogram from a perfect bolus. Let's suppose we were able to give a perfect bolus of radiopharmaceutical injected straight into the renal artery and somehow we were also able to uh, avoid it coming round a second time by recirculation. So the activity in the blood coming into the kidney and the renal artery is a spike that rises briefly and comes straight down again and never returns. Under those circumstances the activity in the kidney would show an initial rise showing blood coming into the kidney followed by a constant portion representing the transit uh, of that radiopharmaceutical through the tubules before it emerges into the bladder. So the time from beginning to end will be the transit time of radiopharmaceutical through the kidney. And because the blood activity is now just a short spike, the blood background in this hypothetical renogram would be a short spike at the beginning. So if we were able to give a perfect bolus injection, this is the shape of the renogram that we would expect. But deconvolution is a mathematical technique that uses the real renogram data to predict what this ideal renogram would look like for each kidney. And it compares the actual kidney curve with the blood curve to produce this graph which is called the impulse response function. So we don't need to give this perfect bolus injection into the renal artery. We can just do an ordinary injection and apply the mathematical technique of deconvolution and produce this idealized impulse response function. That's also easy to interpret because it quantifies uptake from the initial height of the curve once we've subtracted blood background which we can do simply by identifying this plateau and extrapolating it to chop off the blood background which is the spike at the beginning. And as a bonus we can also measure the renal transit time from beginning to end of this curve. So here I've mentioned two different techniques. The Rutland method is a mathematical technique that essentially takes the real renogram data and distorts it to simulate an ideal constant infusion renogram. The graph we get there was called the Rutland plot and the intercept tells us how much blood background there is in that kidney and the slope tells us the function of that kidney. It's robust and reliable um, and it's quite easy to apply. Deconvolution on the other hand takes the real renogram data and processes it to simulate an ideal bolus renogram. The graph we get there is called the retention function and the initial spike is the blood background, the initial height is the kidney function and the duration measures the renal transit time. Unfortunately that technique is very sensitive to noise and to poor quality data and is therefore much harder to apply than the Rutland method. However, both techniques require appropriate software on your nuclear medicine computer system. I have a lot more to say about these techniques, um, so if you want to know more, uh, I have a separate talk on the Rutland method and a separate talk on deconvolution, and both of those give much more details about these techniques. So it's interesting to compare deconvolution with the Rutland plot. Both facilitate blood background subtraction by different methods but they allow you to get a measure of how much blood there is in each individual kidney and subtract it appropriately. Both quantify kidney uptake. They do it in different ways but they ought to be just as good. Deconvolution quantifies mean transit time whereas the Rutland plot doesn't seem to have that benefit. But I'll come back to that in a moment. Deconvolution is unfortunately very sensitive to noise, whereas the Rutland plot is insensitive to noise and therefore much easier to use. 
deconvolution can be upset by administration of a diuretic such as frusamide, whereas the Rutland plot isn't. That's something I haven't talked about so far in this talk, but I go into it in more detail in my talk on diuresis renography. Deconvolution is also sensitive to timing errors, whereas the Rutland plot is robust against timing errors. Again, that's something I explain in my other talks. So comparing the two, we see that the main benefit of deconvolution is to quantify mean transit time. But what if we could get mean transit time from the Rutland plot? Well, if we compare these techniques, we can see that the real renogram has blood activity that falls with time and produces a renogram with a falling background and the kidney activity superimposed on it. If we apply deconvolution, we simulate a bolus input where all the blood activity comes in right at the beginning uh, and in the impulse retention function the background therefore is a spike at the beginning whereas the kidney activity is a constant activity before it falls. So the initial rise is the uptake in the kidney and the duration is the transit. Actually more formally it's the area under that green part of the curve which gives us the mean transit time. If we apply the Rutland method, we simulate a constant infusion where the blood activity is constant and that spreads the background out uniformly throughout the Rutland plot and the kidney activity becomes a linear rise. That linear rise measures the uptake. So we have apparently two different techniques, but back in 2003, Mike Rutland himself observed that the two curves, the impulse retention function and the Rutland plot can be related by an integration. So imagine that we start off at time zero, represented by this yellow line, and we integrate or add up all the counts in the impulse retention function. As we move forward for the first few seconds, we soon gather all the background, and so in the Rutland plot we get an initial rise in the background, but thereafter it doesn't change. Over the next few minutes, we move on through a constant kidney activity in the impulse retention function and that causes the integral to rise linearly in the Rutland plot. At the end we sum up the final few counts in the kidney in the impulse retention function and that makes the integral in the Rutland plot reach a maximum and thereafter it doesn't change. So if the area under the green curve represents the mean transit time on the impulse retention function, maybe the height of this plateau also represents mean transit time in the Rutland plot. Certainly that is the case under certain circumstances, but it may not always be true. It's complicated by the fact that the horizontal axis of the impulse retention function is real time, whereas the horizontal axis of the Rutland plot is a stretched time. I, I like to call it Rutland time. But maybe we can calculate mean transit time from the Rutland plot, which would mean that we wouldn't need to bother with deconvolution at all. We could get everything from the Rutland plot. So that's the end of part five. In part six, I'll finish by explaining how we calculate relative function and how we quantify elimination.